It is a throwback Thursday on the Mighty Metro FM Sports that Amplified with Andy Le, your favorite show of the week for most who love to hear good stories. Throwback Thursday on Sports that Amplified with Andy Le is exactly that. Remember, I said earlier, we told you the story of Lucas Sitola and how he lost his legs and his um, arm and later became a major winner, winning two majors, the US Open as well as the Australian Open. The other week, we paid tribute to the late Alex Goldfinger Chakwane. Uh, Louis Chakwane coming on here and telling us uh, stories of a man that he competed with but saw as a brother with the founder of Mamelodi Sundowns come and tell us how he ended up at Sundowns in the first place. It was an amazing story. Tuduza Nezume was here last week to speak about um, his lineage in boxing, really, which you and I both didn't know about his involvement in sport. But look at where we got to with that conversation. Where is today's conversation going to take us? I've got a book in front of me. Uh, as soon as I'm done with the, because I'm almost done with the Mam Kiza book, My World, My my Rules, I'm going to get into this, my journey to the top of the world and the life lessons I learned along the way. Sarah Kumalo. Sarah is with me in studio now. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us and welcome. Thank you, Andile. Thank you for having me. You know, Timmy and I, uh, Timmy is, as our producer, were talking about having you. This is a while back. And he said, Andy, this is a phenomenal story. Um... Uh, and then and, and somebody that had to overcome so much. Right now, when you see what's happening in the world, this was us yesterday now. Yeah. We said, when you see what's happening, when you see how people are giving up, when you see how people are looking at mountains and saying, that is beyond me, mm. and quitting and going back and some uh, plenishing and you know never seeing light because of it, we need to tell a different story. Absolutely. But I mean, happy Africa Day first. <laughs> happy Africa Day. You look Day. lovely. You you know, you, you you look like the colors of Africa. Um, yeah, I am an Africa, in no and out. Tell yeah. me about your story with Africa because you, you yes, you've uh, uh, made a home in South Africa and you've yeah. found home in South Africa, but your, your, your lineage, uh, it crosses the continent, doesn't it? It does indeed. So my mother is from Rwanda. Uh, my grandparents came from Rwanda. They were missionaries. They settled in the DRC. Uh, it was called Zaire then. I was born in Zambia, um, and uh, I've, I mean, I've lived in Zambia, I've lived in, in Zimbabwe. I used to go for holidays in Tanzania, and this is my home. Uh, yeah. And when did the love of sport begin in all that journey? Have you always loved sport? Have you always been an actively sporty person? Absolutely not. I'm one of those kids. <laughs> I'm one of those kids that went to school with a uh, letter to say there is something wrong with her breathing. She shouldn't participate in uh, oh, no. athletics, <laughs> athletics because my mother believed that academics was it for us. Yeah. You know, it was the way out. Um, I, I remember after my second attempt of Everest going home and saying, what was wrong with me? You know, mm. <laughs> and she says, no, there was nothing like you know, what did you want to do, netball, you know? So it, it's um, the old way of thinking. But one thing that's been consistent is I've always been a tomboy, always been outdoorsy. I was part of the Pathfinder Club, which in my church is a bit like scouts. Mm. So doing notes and camping, um, that's been consistent throughout um, throughout my life. And that's what hiking and, and climbing um, does, really. It's taking you a little bit out of your comfort zone, being able to survive with a, with as little as possible and being able to travel the trails less traveled and hmm. to see the wonderful world out there. When did you fall in love with the mountains? Um, started in 2012. Um, I um, Maybe a little bit before that, I, I, I went to the U.S. and... Um, with delusions of how America is the best. Delusions of grandeur. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And then I discovered that they were not as clever as I, as uh, coming to America had, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> had depicted, <laughs> had yes, depicted, fooled us absolutely. all. Absolutely. They were like, oh, born in Zambia, which state is that? And I thought, <laughs> okay. You know, do you know my friend in Nigeria? And oh, somebody goodness. said to me, you know, have you done Kilimanjaro? And I said, no. And they really went to town about this, Andile. And I thought to myself, that is my story. So it became something on my bucket list. Um, so somebody in the USA says yeah. to you, oh, you're from Africa. Yeah. Have you done Kilimanjaro? Meaning, have you climbed it? Yes. And I said, no. And they really went to town about it. The whole evening wasn't about, you know, my friend in Nigeria anymore. It was about Kilimanjaro. And I was learning from this person. So I thought, no, that should be my story. And I decided to put it on my bucket list, like many people have it on their bucket list. And um, 
Years went by, procrastinating, life happened, <laughs> had children and so forth. Um, and in 2012, after I lost my older sister and, and started going through my own searching of my why, you know, um, what am I living for? And one of the things that I went back to is my grandfather saying, if you don't live a life of service, it's a life wasted. Mm. And, and, and that as a kid, you don't understand it. But at that moment, I kind of latched onto that and I thought I needed to live a life of, of, of service. So while climbing Kili, we raised money for Kids Heaven, a home in Benoni that looks up the street kids, enough to build an outdoor gym worth about 200,000 rands. We converted a garage into a library for the children. So when handing over these things, one of the kids in the home said to me, do you really come from the township? You know, hmm. I, I, that initially felt like a joke, like do black people swim kind of joke. Yeah. Um, so I smiled and he says, no, I'm serious because people like us don't do things like this. It's the st exchange students that come from the U.S., from Europe. Mm. When they come and they leave, they do things like this. You know, that, that bothered me because I had just left my job and, and moved to another job trying to find almost a purposeful project. You know, one that's not just about money, that's about me giving back. Um, and, and I looked at that child on reflection. It was She was me when I was young, looking mm. at Wonder Woman and Superman and thinking they're epic, but they, they are not me. They, don't, they are flying around. I can't fly. They don't speak like me. So the superheroes are for me to watch, and I can never be one of them. And how life works is yeah. once you've found that and once you want to do it and once you start to seek it and pursue yeah. it, it throws something in your way to say how badly do you want it because if you do yeah. get over this absolutely it gave you a hurdle that would physically and otherwise emotionally and in any way you can think of it leave scars in you yeah. that will remind you for life about this journey you've chosen talk to me about that one incident that changed your life well, there's many. Uh, one is uh, the the first one on the mountain is uh, in 2014, we lost 16 Sherpas. I was really, I still had romantic ideas about Everest. And uh, I was there as a novice and suddenly these 16 people were buried by an avalanche and they were more experienced than I was. You were traveling uh, together in the, in, in the same class of climbers? Some of them were in our camp, but the ones that died were not in our camp, were in camps adjacent to us. Hmm. Um, and, and you start having a sense of um, survivor's guilt. You know, yeah. they die because I wanted to climb. Did they die because it was their time. And, and in conclusion, I just believe that people die because it's their time. 16 people. 16. Buried in an avalanche. Yes. As you guys are climbing, snow comes falling down. Yeah. And they can't get out and up from that. Exactly. And, and you are there and you say, this is what I want to do? Yeah, so initially I was I was scared like everybody else, and I went to guys that had been doing this forever to try and figure out, so what do we do? And they looked just as scared as I was, you know. And somebody sent me a message to say, figure out why you've been spared, what you need to learn, and that will inform your next steps. And I did exactly that. You know, I was saved for a reason. So the sense of agency in terms of what I needed to do with my life before my time came, um, became very apparent, you know. Um, I think that w we we can be afraid of death, but it's coming. You know, the point is, did you leave before it did? So I went back hmm. to Everest. Um, Twenty fifteen was an earthquake. So that particular climb, you didn't finish, right? You didn't. No, you didn't no, summit. The mountain was closed, and everybody was. So asked after to go that, back. obviously, Absolutely, go back. We yeah. need time to deal with this. Exactly. Yeah. And then after all of that, you said, I need to go back. Yes. And climb the same mountain where sixteen died in front of me. <laughs> is that is that, is that what I'm hearing? Uh, you know, Angela, you make it sound strange, but we drive on N one every day. How many of us have lost their lives on that road? Wow. You know, I I, I don't think we should stop living. The, what what changed and shifted Jeez. for me is that. I climb, so I climb with a purpose. I raise money for education, but I also take life-preserving steps. I'm not going to take risks 
unnecessarily. There is something that we call a summit fever in the climbing world, where people want to get to the summit at all costs, not understanding, am I going to be physically able to come down? Do I have enough oxygen? So you take calculated for, the, for, for those that don't know, just explain the journey to, to summit. How many days is it? How? Yeah. Well, well, what is this deep incline uh, like in terms of numbers? What is this cl- incline like? Yeah. So that we get, we get and uh, if, if you were to I'm a mere mortal who's lived in South Africa all my life. Yeah. You know, if that's my case, and I haven't really traveled to cold places, yeah. the coldest I'll experience is maybe qua qua, you know, <laughs> weather. You know, what else? What other places really cold in South we Africa? We need to take you to the Drakensberg. So, what, 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 what sort of cold? Yeah. What sort of climb? How long does this take? How would you depict this picture? So somebody that's listening now yeah. can see the picture in their head. Um, so the coldest I've measured on Everest, uh, Camp 4, I think 2017, was minus 42. Um, minus 42 degrees Celsius. Yeah, yeah. But when you start climbing, when you start hiking up from Lukla, first you land in Lukla, which is the most dangerous airport in the world. Um, the runway is about 420 meters long. The runway at Ortambo is over four kilometers, just to give you context. You hike up just like you would hike on Table Mountains uh, or any other hiking spot locally, all the way up to Everest Base Camp. Now, let me tell you. Yeah. If you if you, you said minus minus forty two minus forty two yeah. degrees Celsius is is is, is the weather right? The mm-hmm. coldest day in South Africa ever in recorded yeah. history was in July of two thousand in Bloemfontein. Mm-hmm. It was minus twelve. That was the coldest recorded day in South Africa, minus yeah. twelve. You talking about times four of that? Yeah, but the reality is we we say there is no such thing as bad weather. It's just bad gear. You (laughs) gear up (laughs) for it, right? (laughs) When you're on a mountain like that, you come prepared. Uh, You know that I'm not going to come with uh, flimsy pants. Um, I'm going to wear double plastic shoes um, just to protect yourself. And over time, since 1953, when the mountain was first summited, a lot has improved. Gear has become a lot more lighter, um, a lot more protective than it used to be. So, yeah. And then, as if that was not enough, did you summit that year? No. So I, I, I attempted uh, four times. I only summited on the fourth attempt. This was... Um, 2019. Yeah, yeah, 16th of May. But before that even, in 2016, yes. you had another hurdle. Yes. So in 2016, I couldn't afford to go back because Everest is not necessarily cheap. Some of the things that I So you guys up, pay to do this? Yeah, of course. You <laughs> I like that question. No, I'm saying yes. I've seen people summit. I've always thought it's a sponsored event and people... Yes, some you are. You guys pay to go and do this? Some are. Um, I wasn't that fortunate with all what, of mine. So what I are the costs associated with summiting um, Everest? An average of uh, between 55 to 100,000 US dollars if you're going with fancy um, outfits. That excludes your flights, exclu- excludes your gear. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I see that I'm not going with you next time. (laughs) (laughs) Fifty-five thousand. Yeah, dollars in rands. That's uh, just over a million. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's it's not a cheap um, exercise. It's something that generally, I mean, traditionally has been white, rich male kind of. You pay a million to go. Yeah. And, and I can imagine you've heard this before. So you yeah. pay a million to go test if you want to live again, like to test <laughs> God with your life. Not necessarily. I think when it's your time, it's your time. Even if you're in your sitting room, when wow. it comes, it'll come. But if it's <laughs> something that you love, there's a reason why you're doing it. You sacrifice for it. And, right? and that's, that's going to be the silver lining to all of this conversation. So if you're following with us right now, we've got an amazing, amazing, amazing story that we want to tell here. The book is called My Journey to the Top of the World. It's Sara Kumalo that uh, tells a story about uh, not just summiting a mountain, but summiting life's mountains. Yeah. Um, and the life lessons I learned along the way is the byline of, of, of the book here. Because, you know, she's had a lot of challenges in going to summit this mountain. Yeah. Those summiting, those mountains she summits are very much like what you and I go through every single day. Your mother's ill. Your child is ill. You don't have a job anymore. You're frustrated at your job. You know, what you get at the end of the month does not cover your bills. You're wondering if you should sell your car and go back to the taxis, but that's so unsafe because you've got a little one. What do you do? The world seems to be just right here in your face and you can't breathe. Whenever you breathe, your breath pushes back at you. What can you do? 
There are people that have come out of those situations and they've written books to tell the story. One of them is sitting across from me. 2016, this for me, when I read about it, was one of those moments where I said, surely after this, mm. you go raise your boys, yeah. you know, you sit at home and, you know, perhaps just tell the stories. What happened yeah. in 2016? So 2016, I couldn't go back because uh, I couldn't afford it that year. I always blame my boss for not giving me enough bonus. <laughs> <laughs> and I was uh, cycling because one of the things that I picked up, guys that were cyclists and, and runners were doing better in the mountains. Okay. So I was part of a, a group who were doing a stage race cycling. First day we did about 60 kilometers. Second day we did, well, I did about 34 kilometers on my 34th kilometer I fell off the mountain bike you know I was coming down the mountain and I tried to break unfortunately I'd lost my back brakes I didn't know that so it I flew off the mountain probably was going about uh, 40 45 kilometers an hour mm. um, landed on a rock cracked my head quite badly um, and, and broke my arm um, ended up in a, in a coma over two weeks in Mill Park um, and uh, I remember just waking up. I didn't think about climbing. I, I was confused about where I was, uh, pulling out the, the tubes and and so forth. Um, I didn't think I would be able to climb ever, you know. I got out um, September. I started walking. Um, I had a Soweto Marathon entry, which um, I was hoping to use in, in November. Tried to give it away. Nobody <laughs> wanted it. Um, then in October, I started running, and I went to Soweto Marathon thinking I'll just do half. Um, and I noticed that guys that were doing the full marathon were all oh, energetic and singing. And I thought, let me do a 42, and I did, and I finished. It was a Sunday. On the Monday, I was back at Mill Park. How, 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 how bad were your injuries? Because um, you're back running? Yeah. Now it, you it had just, broken it, your arm. Yeah. The, the head injuries were quite bad. Um, they thought I would lose my eye. Um, they didn't think I would be able to function um, normally, so the brain was swollen. Some, in the end, it was induced um, coma, um, but in the beginning, it wasn't. So, um, yeah, I cracked my f my 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 skull. Um, my uh, my eye was almost out. Uh, they had to put of it the back socket. in. Yeah, I had a few facial surgeries just to um, to reconstruct. Uh, it was it was pretty bad. I mean, they my mother was uh, was called to come and say goodbye. My sisters came from the UK and so forth. So it was really bad. But uh, it wasn't my time, you know. You you were talking about the mountains being dangerous, but I almost died on a mountain bike, you know. So I, th I think it's not about being so afraid to take that next step. It's about uh, thinking, what if I fly? Because if we continuously think, what if, what I, if I, I fall? We'll never do anything. That will paralyze us uh, from moving forward. I think if you fall, learn from it and keep going because you it's, it's happening for you to be stronger for the next challenge. I believe that very strongly. I think that's one thing that I've taken out from my mountaineering journey and, and from Everest itself, from seeing all the experiences. Wow. It's 6.36 on the Mighty Metro FM. Let's take a very quick break. When we come back on the other side, we continue with the story. It's for you. If you have a friend that you know right now that's, uh, that's struggling, have them listen. Or you listen on their behalf so you can, with the energy of whatever comes out of here on this beautiful Africa Day, retell it to them. Let's take a break. When we come back, of course, um, we'll carry on with our story. Remember, 1845... Um, Zero six zero double five two seven three zero three. We take your WhatsApps after we've spoken to Faith. Zero eight six double zero zero two one six zero. I genuinely believe that sport is not what happens in a ninety-minute game, a sixty-minute game, or you know, a, between the time that uh, a ball is kicked, a ball is hit, um, uh, a bat is tossed. I think sport is what happens your whole life as an athlete. Sport is what happens when you're preparing. Sport is what happens how you take the losses and the wins. That's all sport. And today, we've got somebody who's giving us a, an eyes view and maybe even other athletes listening to this. Uh, we've got a lot of athletes that listen to the show, you know, coaches and people involved in sports in general who could learn a thing or two from this about how to summit our own personal journeys in life. Mm. Sarah Kumar is with us. Uh, she has written a book. Uh, it's called My Journey to the Top of the World. And uh, the byline, of course, is uh, and the little life lessons 
and the life lessons rather I learned along the way, Sarah Kumalo. And she was just telling us a story of a horrific day in 2016 where she came down a mountain on a bike, uh, fell off the mountain because the brakes in the back had uh, had broken and she wasn't aware of it. Does it. So you then use the front brakes, is it? Is that what yeah, it is? Yeah, so you, you, balance, you balance the front and, and, and back to be able to but stop. But when you're going at 40 and there's yeah. no back brakes. So it just um, yeah, tripped me. And uh, yeah, the next thing I remember is... Um, um, at, mean, the hospital, at the hospital, no problem. Hospital, yeah. So you come out, you do the Soweto Marathon, and you yeah. go back to the hospital. Yeah. At what point do you then say, hmm, that Everest where 16 died before, <laughs> I've just nearly died, yeah. that's where I need to go? Yeah, Um. I, I think it was immediately after I finished. I mean, I've got a photo of me jumping at uh, the FNB Stadium after the, the, the run. I couldn't wait to get to Mill Park to say to my doctor, I, I want to go. You know, I think the, the woman just didn't want to get involved. Like three weeks before you leave, come and see me. And I went back. You know, Andila, I think what is important is for us to determine what success is for us. Mm. I don't believe that when I went back in 2015, um, that was a failure. The world may see it as a failure because I didn't summit. But the lessons that I got out of there were just immeasurable. I, I, I started climbing differently because of 2014, because of what I saw, what I experienced. And I believe very strongly 2019 was not success in isolation of all the unsuccessful attempts that I, I went through in, in the three years, 2014, 15, and 17. So I think getting there in 2017 after the fall um, and the coma and getting all the way up to um, the South Summit, which is 99 meters from the top, was a successful um, attempt for me because I had never, it was my personal best. Um, was it what I had aimed for? There's obviously a level of disappointment, um, but there's also a level of realization that I cannot change this. Mm. I need to accept it and quickly get into what do I need to do so that when I come back, I can do it better. I can actually go for success um, that I need. I can imagine climbing after everything that you've been through, yeah. after having seen, you know, people, having heard, having known people that have passed, yeah. and, and then the number that they did, 16 people passed that day, yeah. having been through what you went through when you nearly lost your life. Yeah. You are now back at the mountain. You're summiting the mountain. What, 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 what? What wisdom, what, what overwhelming clarity? Is there a moment of wusa that comes when you see the top? Because you don't see the top. Yeah. When you finally see it, when you say, I don't, I'm not sure how far it is when you can finally yeah. see it. Is, w w what comes off your shoulders? A, a, a level of uh, relief. Um, for me, I remember just... Uh, I don't, you haven't uh, hiked, you said. Oh, um, no. The, the guides and always thanks, tell after you... thanks, this, I will not. <laughs> <laughs> the guides always tell you, it's there, you're almost there, and you get there, and it's not. So I remember going all the way up to the top, to the edge, and almost falling. I'm like, okay, this is the top. And then I sat down, because I was exhausted. I mean, you go through the death zone. Um, oxygen levels are so low. You're using supplemental oxygen. One step feels like a 10 kilometer run or 21 kilometer run. So, and, and it's cold. You have to protect yourself. You have to anchor yourself. The winds are crazy. Um, and I sat down and, and I just cried. Um, and then I remember my mother, because you sit up there, all the clouds are beneath you. So is that all you see, cloud? Uh, clouds and a sea of mountains all the way into the horizon with like almost um, rainbows, you know, covering mm. all of them up. This is something but that only people that have been at the top of Everest will ever know. Uh, absolutely. That's the thing. You know, I, I've been there. I was there for a flirting moment compared to a, an eight-week expedition that it is, but no one takes that away from you. What did I your mom always, say? Um, so, first of all, when I was there, I remembered my mom always saying, the sky is the limit and how wrong she was because I was above the clouds. Wow. And if let's reflect on that. We always, we aim for what we have seen around us, what we've seen America doing, what we've seen our neighbors doing. But we, we are capable of a lot more of the unimaginable. I think we need to raise a, almost a limitless generation, a generation that does not believe. So we should change clouds. that adage. Absolutely. To not even the sky is the limit. Yes. We, we belong above the Because there clouds. you are, above the sky at the highest point. The sky is our stepping stone. 
I think when our children and grandchildren start thinking like that, Africa will be different. Wow. We're going to continue with the story in a little bit because I, I want to round it up with, with you reading um, the last passage in, in your book there because I think it's important that we hear that. At 6.49 in the mighty Metro FM, a sports that amplified with Andy. I am Andy Lingube. And uh, my guest today, Sarah Kumalo, is a mountaineer, author, leadership expert, and global speaker. She's here on Africa Day telling us the most amazing story about um, her summiting Mount Everest. But it wasn't about the mountain. It was the mountains before she got there. Sarah, mm-hmm. I keep saying that because yeah. that's, that's, that's what I take from it. Mm-hmm. But what is... When you when you sit back and you look at it, you know we always say that uh, hindsight is the best sight. Yeah. When you sit back there, and, and I can imagine this all came when you were writing the book. Yeah. What is what 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 what, what has been the lesson? Has it been all worth it? Sitting on the top of that mountain, hearing your mother's words, and, and thinking, no, there's life beyond that. Yeah. Sitting there and seeing something that only a handful of people in the world, yeah. in the history of the world, will ever get to see. Yeah. Andile, Was it all worth it? Absolutely worth it. You know, I didn't go to Everest to um, focus on representation. It came through because when I got there, people looked at me and assumed I must be going to Everest Base Camp. A, because I'm female. B, because I'm black. You know, um, and, and it, it became very annoying. And I made it my mission that next time they see someone like me, they must give them the benefit of the doubt that they give everybody else. Hmm. So it was definitely worth it. I believe that people that will come after me will do it faster, will do it quicker, won't make the mistakes that I've made. But they know that it, it's doable. It can be done. It becomes an option. I mean, I'm looking at this and uh, you almost done at the Grand Prix, aren't you? Yeah, um, yeah, I've just finished the seven summits. Um, so tell me about them. Which are you've done? Kilimanjaro. Yeah, yeah so yeah. Kilimanjaro, Aconcagua in South America, Elbrus in Russia, um, Mount Denali in North America, Mount Vincent, uh, which I did in December in Antarctica. I just did Kosciuszko um, in Australia, and of course um, Kilimanjaro. Was that seven? Yeah. I think so yeah. What now? So I'm I'm meant to to uh, ski to the, the North Pole. Um, in 2019, <laughs> I skied to the South Pole. <laughs> yeah, so I'm doing what is called the so Explorer if you don't Grand mind, Slam. Um, yes. And I know it's available here because yeah. you speak about it. How old are you? Oh, I'm <laughs> 51. Why? Is that a shock? <laughs> yes, I'm 51. Um, yeah. Gee whiz. So much life still ahead, but so much life lived. What is interesting is that I started climbing really seriously after when I turned 40. I think the, the, something goes through your mind where you think there's more to life than that salary and the big car. You know, the, it's about leaving the world just a little bit better. Can I do something else other than climbing? Of course, but mine is climbing. I love it. And uh, yeah. I want you to read the passage first when we say goodbye. Right now, though, I'd love to hear from uh, all of you out there. Let's let's get into this conversation. If you um, have been listening, I'd love to hear from you. One of our own here at the station, Mazala Malefe, um, happened to be listening, and I hope he's listening with these girls. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because what a story! And I know mine is listening now, and I'm glad that she listened to today's show. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's 11 years old. Oh, um, and I, I'm hoping that. You know, she got some of that. Uh, but Muslim Malefi here says, uh, please tell Sarah, I take my hat off to her. Wow, unbelievable. Thank you. He even goes and says, this woman with exclamation marks and a big, <laughs> and a big mouth gasping. Uh, let's play maybe one or two uh, voice notes because uh, uh, I want to take the calls as quickly as possible. I've got to Mr. Um, Sibia, I think that is, and Utuli as well that I'd like to take. But uh, quickly, maybe one uh, voice note there quickly. Yo, yo, we gonna get them. Get connected. What's at the Metro FM studio? Oh six oh double five two seven three oh three. Good evening, Metro FM team. Good evening, Andile and your wonderful guest. Wow, so much wisdom right there. So inspiring and uh, so uplifting. I need to get my hands on that book. Uh, this is Adrian in uh, Jobek. Evening, Miss Andile. Yes, Pershawn Dusan from Diwan. Yeah, Sarah Kumal. What an amazing story, yeah? Yeah, to follow, yeah, yeah. The sky is not the actual the limit. Mm. Yeah, we're trying here also in other spot codes. Yeah, we, we will get there one day. Big up, Joshua. What inspiring uh, uh, story. Big up. Really appreciate it. Let's go to Tuli. Tuli's out in Pretoria. Tuli, thank you so much for calling. Welcome. 
Hello, Andile. Hello, Sarah. Hi, Tuli. Hi, Tuli. Um, yo, this is Tuli from Pretoria. Yo, Andile, I'm so, so inspired by Sarah. I really need the book. Before she goes, please tell her to tell us the details on how to get hold of it. And I actually have a question for Sarah. Mm. So, Sarah, like when you're in the mountain, eh? Where do you guys pee? Where do you do number two? <laughs> <laughs> That's an important question, Tuli. Come to think of it. Yeah. It's a good one, Ned. When I was driving home and I was like, where do they do those things? Can you please tell us, Sarah? <laughs> can I tell you, Sarah, even worse, as a guy, you know, I can imagine taking out my package in, in, in yeah. minus 42 weather. <laughs> <laughs> it freezes immediately. You know what I mean? So how does that happen? Yeah, so it depends on where you're at uh, in the mountain. Mm -hmm. So lower down, you know, you you go as normal in the toilet. But further than Everest Base Camp, you have wag bags um, that you use. Some people do it in the crevasses, which is not necessarily right. But you actually pee in a bottle, especially above Camp 2. You pee in a bottle um, and you just make sure it doesn't freeze (laughs) because the bottle has got limited space. Um, you put it in your sleeping bag so that it, you keep it warm. Just remember that when you wake up to drink water, you're not drinking your pee. Um, the other complication is beyond uh, Everest Base Camp, you share the tent with other people. So there will be pee bottles for multiple people. And, but uh, you, you don't know. obviously take your clothes off when you do this. You have to do um, it with clothes on. Um, no, there's zips. They, they, there's, yeah, with your uh, clothes mechanic, on, you yeah, just open the absolutely. zip and because you can't. Otherwise, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, I mean, your butt freezes off if you are, uh, you know, outside. So wow. you kind of do it in a tent. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. I appreciate your call. No, I mean, I was just curious. But anyway, I'm very much motivated and... I love your show, man. I'm not really a sporty person, but ever since I started working in Centurion, every time when I go, I come back home, I listen to your show, and I love it. You're so wonderful. Thank you very much. Truly, we really appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, that means the world to me and my team because we always say this is not a show for people that love sports. This is a show for people that love mm-hmm. to get uplifted and listen to great stories and get motivated in some way exactly. or another. Thank you so much, Truly. I appreciate that. Okay, the one thing that uh, uh, to, uh, I thought that uh, um, Timmy couldn't write, I thought he was trying to write Mr. Sibia there, but I see it's a Ugandan gentleman, and I'm terribly sorry, so I'm going to ask you to tell me your surname because I cannot uh, uh, articulate what Timmy has written there properly. Yes, Andre, I'm called Sediala from Uganda. Oh, Mr. Sediala, very nice to meet you, sir. Please, yes, uh, I'm here. Yes, I, re- I really love your show, and I'm so excited. I'm so excited to to hear that lady the which I, I'm with uh, I'm a, a, a hiker as well mm. of mm. Table Mountain this side of Cape Town yeah. also I'm coming from Uganda but she really inspired me because the way eh, that woman she did uh, pass through a lot to reach where she is mm. so I would like also uh, I would like to ask her if she has, she has got some other young ones which she has been uh, uh, doting how to climb, how to to go to the mountain. But I really love your show. Thank you so much, man, Mr. Sibiana. I really appreciate it. Out in Uganda, I was there in December last year. Absolutely loved Kampala, Uganda. Thank you for giving us a shout here. Yeah. You do do some mentoring. Absolutely. I do mentoring. Uh, during COVID, we actually, a friend of mine and I raised money um, to train three women who um, live in the Drakensberg to become guides. If you think about it, the shapers, some of them are not educated, but yeah. they're the ones that are actually, they've created an economy in that yeah. environment. We can create an economy around the Drakensberg. I'm also now part of the Mountain Club, and we are actually going into communities and helping people. I'm sure you've noticed maybe not because you don't hike, that there's more and more diversity on the trails. Oh, yeah, that I But noticed. people don't know what they're doing. So um, with uh, the Mountain Club, we're trying to find ways to transfer the skills so that we can hike safely. We can leave the environment the way we found it for the next generation. You've got two boys. Everybody's yeah. going to want to support you. Yeah. The one thing they can do is support your youngest son. Please tell them very quickly about your youngest son. Yeah, my youngest son, Utkakile Kumalo. I love the name. <laughs> yeah. Yes, he plays uh, soccer, 40S Galaxy, just 
started about two months ago, and he was man of the match about three weeks ago. Signed with Tim Sugazi's yeah. TS Galaxy. Yeah. Look out for Katrile Kumalo. That is Mamsara's uh, uh, youngest son there. So yeah. if you want to support her, that's the one thing you can do, isn't it? Yeah, support absolutely. her son. Thank you. Appreciate Please read that, that uh, uh, passage for us there okay. um, from your book, so My I, Journey to the Top of the World. Yes, I end my book with good luck. Every one of us has his or her own personal mountain to climb. It might not be Everest and it might not be a physical mountain. Yours might be in the boardroom, on a bicycle, in your family, or even in the health of your own body. The reality is there is always something that we need to achieve, something big and difficult and meaningful. Whatever it is, continue to believe in your limitless potential because the summit is possible if you keep stepping. I believe that we are all extraordinary and have the capacity to do extraordinary things in our lifetime. Whatever your personal Everest, I wish you strength, purpose, kind weather, and some luck, but more importantly, God's blessings. And when you get there, remember to be thankful. Reach down and pull someone else up with you. Thank you. I'm scared to speak. I don't want to ruin what you've just heard. Joyce Kungwane, uh, sister of Sheikhs Kungwane, the great, the late, and also a boxing promoter. The only black one that I know that's doing as amazing that she does. I know there's others, but it's the only one I know. She's listening to the show, and I'm glad she did. Because I know that she needed to hear everything you had to say. we got to get out of here. Thank you so much. It's top of the hour, 7 o'clock. That's all the time we had from Makumalo and uh, Thank you. her you know, book, My Journey to the Top of the World. We're grateful that you made time for us. Timmy Team, once again, amazing work. To my whole team, it's, it's a huge team. We're truly grateful for your ears every day. Timmy T. Miranda, the producer. Malcolm Glover, the tech producer. We've got Beasel, who makes sure that uh, you catch all of these on social media, on our platforms, wherever it is that if you did miss it. And take imaging, of course, by the genius Tabongwala. We appreciate you. From Obaba Gantando. Itombe Tando Pela Pela. Nanzo me.